Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. Today we're going to be discussing food poisoning and tis the season right now with all the holidays and all the fancy cooking, going out to eat, eating everybody else's food. I want to address this issue um, about what causes it, what the symptoms are, and what we can do about it. So first of all, causes, mostly due to the improper handling, storage, not washing the hands, uh, not keeping it cold enough, or chemically contaminated food. When you go into a restaurant, everybody's so worried about being clean that oftentimes the things they clean their pots and pans with, the chemicals around, the cleaning agents for the grill, you can get chemical food poisoning as well. So what we try to do under those circumstances with chemical poisoning, much more difficult to treat, um, and we'll talk about that a little further on. The standard food poisoning though that we normally experience has to do with either bacterial, viruses, spores, and we'll find those in things like Staphylococcus, Salmonella, E. coli, Clostridium. Those are usually found in contaminated water, contaminated meat, particularly poultry, beef, um, unpasteurized milk products if there's not proper cleaning that's going on, uh, and poultry particularly more so if it's undercooked. Um, we see botulism uh, spores are found in canned goods, uh, botulism spores. Botulism can be deadly and it can kill you within 24 to 48 hours. It can be, it's very fast. It usually takes a little bit of time to build up, but once it explodes full blown within that 24 to 48 hour period, it can be deadly. So that comes from grandma's canned goods or canned goods that got damaged in the grocery store and ah, we take a chance on that dented, pretty heavily dented can. I wouldn't do it. Just make sure you get cans that are in good condition or that if grandma's uh, uh, tomatoes that have been sitting on the shelf for four years that she did four years ago, I wouldn't use it. Um, the best, best saying I can give you, if in doubt, throw it out, get rid of it. Whether it's the leftover turkey that's been sitting in the refrigerator for three or four days, if you have any doubt about it, something doesn't smell right, look right, feel right, toss it. It isn't worth it. Um, we also, of course, have chemical, which are, can be from insecticides, pesticides, strawberries with a methabromide. Uh, a customer of mine just the other day was telling me about a friend of his, then washed the strawberries, sat there and ate the strawberries and got deathly ill and most likely from the chemicals that they utilize on strawberry crops. So once again, whenever you can do organics in that regard, you lessen your chances of having a chemical poisoning. Parasitical or amoeba based. Um, we see that a lot with water. You go to strange places, strange, well, different countries, that type of thing. You can get parasitical infections, uh, which can range thousands of different kinds of paras parasites, thousands. But the most common are amoebic based and they'll cause you a lot of diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, fever, abdominal pain and cramping. Um, breathing and talking problems, that's when you get into the severe stages uh, where the fevers can get very high or it can affect you neurologically, particularly with botulism, uh, where people will literally can't process their thoughts or speak or their breathing gets out of tempo. Uh, dehydration then sets in when we have all this diarrhea and vomiting going on. And dehydration is a killer, particularly in small children. When you lose a lot of water, 48 hours, a small child can become extremely dehydrated, enough to where it can be life-threatening. So we're going to talk about a few things that you can do to prevent some of that dehydration that may occur if you're vomiting or have diarrhea from food poisoning. When you're talking about the diet that accompanies, when you know you got food poisoning and it's like, okay, I got it, okay. If it's relatively minor, it'll pass usually within a couple of days. And once again, I'll mention some supplements that can help you pass it further. But when you have diarrhea or vomiting, you're good, you lose tons of electrolyte minerals. And those help balance the heartbeat, regulate, they do a lot of things, okay? So drinking lots of water with electrolytes, and not just drinking lots of water, with electrolytes. And there are little packet mixes you can get. There are pills. There's products such as Pedialyte and Gatorade. They tend to have a lot of sugar in them. And since you're wanting to drink a glass of those every two or three hours, you might want to look more to like a little electrolyte powders or electrolyte pills to take and drink with water, a glass of water every two to three hours. 
uh, drinking diluted fruit or vegetable juices. It's kind of interesting. When you go through food poisoning, your body is detoxing. It's trying to detox whatever that bacterial, viral, or whatever it is, chemical. But at the same time, it's actually detoxifying itself. So there is some benefit to having food poisoning from a detoxification process. So we kind of want to have foods that are very mild and gentle on the body that will allow the detox to take place, but that will prevent you from becoming extremely dehydrated. So you're going to want to avoid, of course, solid foods because your digestion, you're just not going to produce the adequate amounts of enzymes to be able to break those foods down. And so doing the vegetable juices and fruit juices, broths are really easy on the digestion. They digest quickly. They also help the detox process and help you get rid of whatever it is that you got poisoned with. Um, avoiding caffeine and alcohol. Now, alcohol or sugar, uh, and we mentioned that a little further up here as well, all sugar, um, feeds the bacteria, it feeds the viruses, it feeds the poisons. So avoid sugar drinks. If you're going to do a juice, make it like a, a grapefruit juice or a, a cranberry without the sugar juice. Um, better yet, do the vegetable juices. They're really easy on the body and they very, very low, low, low sugar. And they have some certain types of minerals uh, in them as well, vegetables, particularly from an organic source. If you can juice them yourselves, great. If you can find a good organic uh, vegetable juice blend, that would be the best way to do it. Um, during recovery, when, okay, I'm not having diarrhea anymore, but I'm just really fatigued and boy, nothing heavy sounds really, really good. The types of foods you want to stick with are going to be like bananas and apples, um, I would say probably some carrots, potatoes, they all have pectins in them. And those pectins tend to slow the digestion down, but they also will bind themselves to toxins. So they're really easy. Brown rice, very easy to digest. It requires very little stress on the body to digest those foods I, that I just mentioned. Now, there are some testing procedures that the doctor can put you through to determine if this goes on more than a few days and we can't get it tackled with diet and supplements. There's testing that your physician can uh, do in a stool analysis, which would include bacterial, um, parasitical, and to check your flora based. Chemicals are harder. Um, the body tends to process them through the liver and get rid of them, but if they're in high amounts, that can come through blood work. But to know exactly what chemical you've been exposed to, since in our foods and everything, we're allowed to use thousands of chemicals here in the United States, very difficult to detect a chemical poisoning. Addressing what we're going to do if we get it. And this can go from the minor cases to the very severe cases of food poisoning. Very first thing, if I suspect that I've eaten anything bad, or even if I go out to eat, I do this anyway, because I know that there are a lot of cultures that don't have the same um, hand washing uh, that we do that tend to cook our food. And so we're seeing, you know, in school we're trained to always wash your hands and everything, but when you have other cultures coming in that aren't trained to do that, they don't tend to wash their hands as well. And so you can get E. coli bacteria, staph bacteria from cuts and wounds that can be passed right on into your food. Um, very first thing, probiotics. Probiotics mean pro-life. They're the good bacteria that can overwhelm the bad bacteria and get them gone. Uh, dosage, you want one with at least 4 billion live active uh, activity to it, and you're going to take that three to five times a day. You'd like it to have an uh, a broad spectrum, including acidophilus bifidus in there. For children, there's specific types. Um, with babies, there's infidus. There's particular types of probiotics. So you want to stick with baby dophilus types of things. With kids that are between four and 11 or 12, there's kids um, dophilus products that have the right types of strains that are appropriate for them. Activated charcoal. Ha! Huh. The hospitals use this a lot to absorb toxins, and it can be chemical toxins, drug toxins, and food poisoning toxins. So if you've got the diarrhea and the vomiting that are coming in, if you can take an activated charcoal, and they usually, it comes in, in capsules, so there's several, many companies that make it, but it's called activated charcoal. 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams every two hours. 
until the vomiting and diarrhea stops. Just keep on taking it. Everything comes out kind of black looking in the bowel, but it will absorb uh, the bad stuff and hopefully slow down the diarrhea and the vomiting as well. The electrolyte supplement I talked about, um, in, in either a capsule form or there's little powders or uh, some companies that specialize in electrolytes, uh, in most of your health food stores carry them, and under those circumstances, I would be doing those three to five times a day. I mean, just really cranking the electrolytes, or if you're mixing with water, every two to three hours mixed in with your water. Oregano oil, good old antimicrobial, kills viral, fungal, and bacterial infections. So if you can preferably get the liquid oregano oil, tastes god-awful nasty, or something called grapefruit seed extract, it kills um, viral, fungal, bacterial, and amoebas. So if you suspect, oh boy, I was down in San Diego and I went to my favorite Mexican food restaurant and I can raise my hand up, and for a few weeks I was fighting it, these types of things will fight that off, especially if it's amoebic based. Golden seal, um, I've written the dosages down here, one milliliter of tincture, or it comes in capsules or in teas as well. Golden seal is also an antimicrobial, but you can also use it during cold and flu season. It's the same with oregano oil. Peppermint, uh, once again, in a tincture form, in capsules or um, in a nice tea. Um, peppermint kind of soothes the cramping and everything that goes in the bowel, and it can also help with the nausea particularly if you combine it with ginger. Ginger uh, also, you know how when you eat, um, mm, let's say for example sushi and along with the sushi, they give these little things of ginger and you're like, nah, I'm going to shove that off. Well remember, ginger also kills amoebic and parasites. So remember, if you don't want the parasitical infection when you're eating the uh, good old sushi, make sure you take along with it the ginger. But ginger in and of itself is antispasmatic and it helps with the nausea and the intestinal infl inflammation that can accompany the food poisoning. Okay, Ginger, for any type of nausea, you'll see, and even during pregnancy, very, very useful. Also helps with circulation and, and inflammation of the, uh, of, the, of the joints as well. There are various homeopathic remedies that will say uh, the most common is arsenicum album in what's called a 30 C's. That's a, a measurement. And if you take three or four of those little tabs, that can help with some of the symptoms of food poisoning. The most common food poisonings that are out there anyway, primarily having to do with bacteria. Parasites. Now, a little bit more complicated and more difficult to diagnose, and that, I think, is where the stool analysis really can come into play. Parasites come all in all makes and models, and they can settle in the intestines, in the liver, in the brain, everywhere and anywhere. And you can get them from vegetables and fruits and from water and from fish and from red meat. You can get them from anything. So that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you thoroughly uh, cook your meat. And if you are eating sushi, to eat that ginger. But if you do suspect you have parasites, you can get a stool analysis. They're only about 50% accurate. But if you do all these types of things and it just doesn't go away, chances are really good you have an amoeba or some type of parasitical infection. And it can come out through the skin, it can come out through the bowel. Parasites can appeal, appear in so many different ways because there's so many different varieties. If you're ever curious, just go online and you can look and you'll get all grossed out. But anyway, the best blends that I found with uh, me personally, and I had them, uh, got a hold of them uh, about nine, what, nine or ten years ago, miserable. Um, the blend that includes, a blend that includes garlic, black walnut, wormwood, clove, and then adding, adding in again, once again, a little bit of the grapefruit seed extract. Uh, over a period of time, uh, we'll kill off parasites. Parasites can take a while. Huh. Taking time with yourself, a couple of months sometimes it takes to get rid of parasites. Now what's interesting is sometimes when you get food poisoning, you'll take stuff and you're, oh, I'm all better, it goes away, and then all of a sudden the bacteria comes back again. So when you're doing certain types of antimicrobials, do them for a couple of weeks. Or your probiotics, do them for a couple of weeks after the food poisoning. 
That way it gives your body a chance uh, to build up those good bacteria, a chance to recover and get rid of, to get rid of it completely. Uh, anyway, we're going to be moving on then. I think this pretty much covers uh, what I needed to on food poisoning. We're going to be moving on to the next portion of our show, which was the fitness portion. fitness portion of our show and today we're going to be using our handy dandy little band and these are cheap easy they travel well they go well in the office they don't take a lot of space actually very little space um, and the exercise I want to show you today I learned from a trainer many many years ago uh, and it's a very good exercise for travel it's a very good exercise for people who like to do archery or actually for golfing as well. Um, I saw this trainer at the time was showing a golfer this particular exercise. And this one basically I'm going to show you works the whole wingspan. So what you do, grab your handy dandy little one um, and you can find different resistances on these depending on what your strength level is. But what you're going to do, <clears throat> as we probably most of us have a little bit of high school archery, is you're going to put your arm straight out uh, parallel with the floor okay and you're just going to simply pull back now if you look my, at my muscles all the way through okay you can see every single one of my muscles looks like it's involved okay so if you sit there and do 10 or 15 of these repetitions like this just very simple basic and then of course we always do the other side <laughs> we like to hit on both angles what this is going to do is this is going to involve all of the muscles. Um, I get a lot of complaints about shoulder girdles and, and the shoulder girdle, um, which is this portion of, of the, um, the shoulder, the whole girdle, um, and especially among a lot of the elderly that they feel a lot of this. And this is actually an exercise that's used by a lot of physical therapists as well. And it's very basic and you can adjust it depending on your band. Um, very helpful, give it a try. I would try 10 to 15 reps on each side uh, for a couple of sets and then see how nice and toned you'll get. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank Hi. you for the intro. Well, of all things that result in weight gain, here's a surprise, and probably not so much of a surprise for vitamin D. Researchers in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism have discovered that with girls who have a higher body fat, they tend to be a little bit lower in vitamin D. In fact, to the point of this, Looking at girls between the ages of 16 and 22, so let's look and talk about young women. They said, quote, we found young women with vitamin D insufficiency were significantly heavier with a higher body mass index and increased abdominal fat than young women with normal levels. They discovered that vitamin D, of course, also plays a role in the height, which we kind of already knew. And then they said, quote, to finish off this subject, because lack of vitamin D can cause fat accumulation and increased risk for chronic disorders later in life. Further investigation is needed to determine whether vitamin D supplements can have potential benefits in the development of healthy young people. Kind of answers the question right there. So vitamin D as far as body fat, real interesting discovery. And again, you can never say too much about vitamin D, it seems like. This is something discovered in regards to type 1 diabetes. Now, we already knew there was a correlation between deficiency in vitamin D and the development of type 1 diabetes. Most people think this type 1 diabetes is genetic or something they cannot prevent. Well, according to the journal, the 2009 January issue of the Journal of Pediatrics, they discovered that youths with type 1 diabetes, 76% of them were deficient in vitamin D. That shocked them. 
They said, again, 76% of them. Of course, their immediate recommendation upon discovery was recommending about 400 IUs of vitamin D to any child with type 1 diabetes. Now, of course, we've seen prior studies which say it requires a minimum of 2,000 IUs of vitamin D just to maintain normal blood levels in children. And now we discussed about a few months ago, too. So keep in mind something that you heard here. And here's something which kind of caught me off guard also. And I tend to be a coffee advocate because caffeine does seem to have a lot of health benefits, but we got to look this in the face for what it is. A quote from the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology and Experimental Biology. They discovered that a low dose of caffeine when pregnant may damage the heart of the offspring for a lifetime. Again, same for a lifetime. What they said, quote, about the equivalent of two cups of coffee. This the study was originally done in mice, so keep in mind. Ingested during pregnancy may be enough to affect fetal heart development and then reduce heart function over the entire lifespan of the child. How much so? Well, pretty significant. They found that all of the adult males exposed to caffeine as fetuses had an increased body fat of 20%, again, all, and decreased cardiac function of 35% compared to mice who were not exposed to caffeine. So you think wine may be bad during pregnancy. Caffeine looks like it trumps it all. And of course, too, when it comes to hunger, which works better, weightlifting or cardio? Well, in the American Physiological Society, they discovered a vigorous 60-minute workout on a treadmill ends up releasing more appetite-suppressing hormones than just weight training itself. Take it from someone who runs a lot. When you get done with a 12- to 15-mile run, you feel like you can't eat for hours. Normally, you think you should be hungry from all the calories you're burnt. You couldn't force yourself to eat, at least in my case. Well, they discovered it works significantly more, the cardio part, as far as reducing appetite than weight training. So if you're concerned about appetite and you have an exercise program, just incorporate a little bit of that cardio. It can make a huge difference in whether you feel hungry or not. But again, real interesting finding out of the American Physiological Society issue. Also, something we kind of already knew about probiotics, but it was confirmed again from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and also published in the American Family Physician. They found out a lot of people stop taking antibiotics because eventually it causes diarrhea. Well, they confirmed what we knew. Probiotics, one, do not diminish the effectiveness of antibiotics, which we once thought. And two, children who took 5 billion IUs of uh, probiotics, not antibiotics, this is the good stuff found in yogurt and milk before it's pasteurized. Probiotics. And adults taking 10 billion I use, not the little tiny stuff you find in little cups of uh, pre-manufactured yogurt, but actual professional strength stuff, significantly reduced any side effects of the antibiotics and greatly enhanced the outcomes. In fact, the Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine said, quote, in our residency program, we worked hard to train our physicians to consider probiotics as an option. Now they are pretty good at regularly prescribing probiotics. But they also said the average doctor is not doing this. And patients often know more about the probiotics than their physicians do. So again, this is some sort of health issue that you may want to take into your own hands. It's important to pay attention. Your doctors have your best interest in mind, but there's only so much information you can have on hand at one time, especially when you're rushed on an HMO or something like that. Second one, now we go more toward the attack segment. Popular class of diabetic dr diabetes drugs doubles the risk of fractures in women. Kind of interesting. This is printed in the Canadian Medical Journal and will appear in the January 6th issue. They looked at two drugs, Avendia, marketed by GlaxoSmithKline, and Actos, marketed by Takeda Pharmaceuticals. And they looked at 10 trials of 14,000 participants that were included in the study. And the data was broken down to gender in five of the studies. And again, about two, four, two to four million women in the United States are taking these diabetes drugs. They discovered not only did it double 
the risk of fracture in this high risk group double. This is how it did it, which is kind of scary. They found out that these medications, Avendia in particular, took, well, let me just read the quote instead. Researchers suggest, researchers suggest that the drugs may cause fractures, ready for this, by replacing bone marrow with fat cells. That's kind of uh, Frankenstein-ish weird stuff. To actually be able to take your bone marrow and replace it with fat cells, we're not only talking about fracture risk, we're talking about immune system, we're talking about repair, recovery, we're talking a whole slew of different things. That's freaky. And of course, they said, quote, they said, basically, at this time, justification for the use of these medications is very weak, if not totally non-existent. And the weird part about it, the American Diabetes Association does not recommend these drugs either, yet they're commonly prescribed. Something you may want to consider with your, med your doctor, your medical practitioner at the time you bring that up. All right, next. Sounds like a big win. Fewer teens are smoking. That was the headline. That came out of uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And they also said, too, less use of illegal drugs. All sounds pretty cool until you find out illegal drugs and illegal use of prescription drugs are two totally separate things. In a 2008 survey, they found out one in eight high schoolers are abusing prescription drugs. Seniors, I take that back. One in eight. And the one being abused most, actually by 10% of high school seniors at any one time, Vicodin. Number one abused medication. And according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, they said it's fantastic that they're smoking less. Obviously, I think what's happened is we're beginning to change who our distributors are. This is not the doctor's fault. This is basically the lazy attitude we take towards medications is treating them as always being perfectly safe. In fact, they said this, after marijuana, the most frequently used illegal drug in this country after marijuana, the next seven most widely abused drugs are all prescription drugs. And the problem with this is kids see prescription drug abuse as being something cool and not against society or not doing anything wrong. Because no word in abusing the prescription drugs do they often relate prescription drugs with being illegal drugs. Well, that's the end of our segment. Some interesting information to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate it. Uh, very good and very helpful. We hope once again that this encourages you to further research and find out for yourself what you can do to stay healthy. Thanks a lot.